Hi guys, in this video, as part of my Q&A New Year special, I'll be answering all of your questions about politics, the channel, myself, and much, much more. Anything ranging from the rise of China, to the rise of authoritarianism around the world, to political reform in the United States, my inspiration for starting the channel, and much, much more. Uh, don't forget to fill in the My Take channel poll, where you can answer uh, just a few quick questions, including future topics for the channel. So make sure to fill that in. Link in the description. Anyway, let's get into it. All right, so the first question is from Cornelius, who is a Patreon, and he's asking, do you believe in Thucydides' trap? And do you see China wanting to be an aggressive hegemon that will challenge the United States and the West, or is China uh, content to share power? And just for those of you who don't know, the idea of a Thucydides trap is basically the idea when you have a dominant superpower and you have a rising power that is coming to challenge that superpower. Of course, that superpower is the United States and the rising power is China. And essentially, I think the, the idea of a Thucydides trap is basically true in this case, that indeed China is trying to challenge the United States. Um, however, if it will lead to conflict is another question. I think several things would need to happen first if there is ever going to be a conflict between China and the United States. Uh, obviously, you would need a decoupling of the economies. At the moment, the economies are very much interlinked. But what you would need to see is at least perhaps a 20-year period of continuing, you know, rising tariffs, protectionism, um, delinking of trade routes, delinking of supply chains, and the United States trying to surround China uh, through its allies, such as you know, obviously South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, but also possibly India, Vietnam. And at the same time, you'd need to see from China increasing aggression toward the United States. And then you'd need some sort of um, incident in perhaps the South China Sea to set off some sort of conflict. But I think there's very, very many steps for a full-scale conflict to ever happen between the United States. And a much more likely scenario is basically some sort of Cold War uh, scenario where you know, China and the United States are competing with each other in, in other countries in, in sort of proxy conflicts or proxy competition. All right. So the next question is from Jonah Cohen, who's asking, what are your credentials in education? And basically, uh, right now I'm studying a master in political science. And before that, in my bachelor, I studied both political science and economics. And so basically that is both, you know, my, my field of expertise, but also my interest. And that's kind of what got me, you know, into this channel. I've always been interested in politics, always been interested in how the world works. And so I thought I would apply that to YouTube. All right. So the next question is from Sousa, who's asking, what do you think the political trajectory of the West is? Will far right populists seize control and bring about illiberal democracies and a net loss for civilization? Well, the way I see it is when it comes to the rise of right-wing populism around the world, uh, including in Europe, uh, I think basically what we will see is the same trends that we have already seen. Look, in some countries, right-wing populists are already in power. We see obviously in Poland and Hungary, or in some countries they're in power, but in the form of a coalition. For instance, in Austria, until recently, there were right-wing populists in the coalition, although they were kicked out because of corruption. And basically, we will see the same pattern, is that in some countries, populists will rise, they'll come to power. In other countries, they'll form part of the coalition and influence policy that way. But even in countries where right-wing populists are not coming to power, we have seen that the influence of right-wing populists on the rhetoric and the policies of mainstream parties is showing. You see that center-right parties are moving increasingly to the right on issues such as immigration. We see, of course, in Britain, the Conservative Party was forced to hold a Brexit referendum because of the influence of UKIP, despite the fact that UKIP was not actually in power. And so basically that's what we will continue to see in the future, that the agenda of right-wing populists will continue to be influential whether they are in power or not. And that brings me sort of to my next question from Ellie. What do you make of the rise of authoritarianism around the world? And basically these are sort of... Um, parallel patterns. Not all authoritarians are populist and not all populists are authoritarian, 
But it seems these days the two often do go together, and we do see the rise of regimes that are flirting with authoritarian measures around the world. And I've talked about it a lot on this channel. Duterte in the Philippines, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Orban in Hungary, the list goes on. And basically, a lot of this is explained by our times. We're living in uncertain times. We're living in times where globalization has been very good for certain groups of people, but not very good for a lot of other people. And so people just want solutions. People want answers. And people sort of want, they want to hear that a tough solution can be there, it can be implemented very quickly and very easily. And the leaders use that to justify getting rid of democratic checks and balances. They say, I need to do this for the people. And therefore, we need to get rid of this check and balance so I can rule easier. And of course, that is always a trap because ultimately what you get is corruption. You get authoritarian rule. And we see that in countries where this happens. We see, for instance, in Hungary, Viktor Orban rewarding his friends uh, with government, uh, government contracts, government projects, often using EU money. And that is ultimately the consequence, even though Viktor Orban himself rose to power against the backdrop of uh, massive corruption in the dominant left-wing government that was there before he came to power. And so basically this is just a reaction to you know the political establishment but unfortunately it is i don't believe that it's the right path and that basically relates to the next question do you believe in the notion of a benevolent dictatorship and the short answer is basically no well it is true that there have been a few examples in history of benevolent dictators such as maybe lee kuan yu in singapore or thomas sankara in Burkina Faso, the exception proves the rule. Almost very few dictators are benevolent, and while democracies are by no means perfect and often function very poorly, most of the poorest, most corrupt, poorly run countries in the world are all dictatorships. And the simple reason for that is, is that dictatorships are mostly just a vehicle for a small elite to accumulate massive amounts of power, massive amounts of money, which often goes at the expense of developing the country. And so while there have been examples of dictatorships that have been good for their people, you know, economically and socially, they are mostly the exceptions and not the rule. So I don't believe in dictatorship. I believe in democracy. All right. The next question is from Niklas. He's asking, do you think that the British Labour Party will win the popular vote, but lose the election in 2024? Uh, I would say Maybe, yes and no. If you look at the polls currently in Britain, whereas the Labour Party suffered a massive defeat in the last elections, they have come back from the ashes under the leadership of their new leader, Keir Starmer, and also under the misleadership or the mismanagement of Boris Johnson uh, with relates to the coronavirus and some of the Brexit issues. And so basically what you see now in the polls is that Labour and the Conservatives are neck and neck in the polls. You also see that Boris Johnson's approval ratings have gone down massively. But again, Britain has a first-past-the-post system, so you don't need to win the most votes, you need to win the most seats. And so in that sense, the polls don't tell us anything. We don't know. Labour could win the next election, they could win the popular vote, but they could also win the popular vote without winning the actual election. All right, Nathan Kane is asking, what is your background? And I think that also relates to another question from Sousa. And basically, you know, it's very simple, my background on... The one side, I'm Dutch. And on the other side, I'm from Zimbabwe. So basically mixed identity. And relating to that question is from Aidan Moore. Can you do an overview of Dutch politics? And I would say that depends on you guys as... I've just said I am Dutch, I do live in the Netherlands, and Dutch elections are just three months away. And so if you guys would like me to do an overview of Dutch politics, make sure you answer the My Take channel poll link in the description. It is one of the options that you can vote for. You can vote for multiple options, so make sure you do that. Then Ben G. Heinrich is asking, uh, basically, should the US adopt Germany's system? And basically in Germany, they have half of the seats in Parliament are elected via first past the post, just like in the US, half the seats are elected with proportional representation. And of course, he's also asking about abolishing the electoral college. Would this system work in America? And basically, I would say, actually, this would probably be the best system that America can adopt. America is a very large country. It's also a federal country, just like Germany. 
And so there is some need for local representation. And so in that sense, having some seats first past the post is good. However, at the same time, first past the post basically is what creates the two party system in America. As long as you have first past the post, you will always have two dominant parties, no matter what. And third parties simply cannot succeed because of the nature of the electoral system. And therefore, if you introduce some seats being elected on proportional representation, you will have multiple parties in America, which will improve the democratic system because currently the Republicans just need to tell you that the Democrats are bad, so vote for them. And the Democrats just need to tell you, look, Republicans are bad, vote for us. And so there's no pressure for either of the parties to actually improve themselves. They just need to make the other party look worse. And so basically a solution to that would be having proportional representation. Abolishing the Electoral College would also be good because it would prevent the minority from being able to decide who the president is, even though you know they haven't won the most votes. And basically, some people say that could cause problems. For instance, um, that only California and Texas would decide the election. That's simply not true. 85% uh, of Americans live in cities that are less than 360,000 in population. So no, the big cities would not determine the outcome of elections. Also, the fear that only a few states would determine the elections. That's nonsense because at the moment, only six or seven swing states determine the elections. So that wouldn't really change anything. It is already the case that only a few states determine the election. So there's no real reason for America to keep the Electoral College except for maintaining minority rule. And then we've got another Patreon question from Cornelius. He's basically asking, what was my motivation for starting the channel and sort of how has it changed my view on politics? And basically the answer to that is basically, you know, I, I've always been, you know, big uh, into YouTube, uh, following other YouTubers who talk about politics, people like uh, Caspian Report, for instance. And so I, I always thought that, you know, the, the mainstream media is very sort of shallow in its analysis of events. Often there are, you know, even sometimes inaccuracies or at least uh, things oversimplified in such a way that is not very useful to understanding the topic. And so I thought by creating a channel where we can actually discuss issues uh, from an in-depth perspective, giving in-depth analysis, but also some of my own opinion. I mean, after all, the channel is my take. I think that's a much healthier way to discuss politics than is currently done on a lot of other YouTube channels, but especially in the mainstream media. And that's sort of my main interest, my main motivation for starting the channel. And then a follow-up to that is basically from Lara Lebeu, is how do I research for this channel? How do I determine between, you know, biased, non-biased sources? And basically, I'd say it's a mix of different things. Uh, one of the key things is that, especially for more in-depth topics, I do try to make use of academic papers rather than only relying on news sources because academic papers, the thing is that they have to be cited. They have to be much more reliable and they can't be nearly, they can't afford to be sensationalist in the same way that news can. And also academic papers usually give a much more broad view of how things are. And some academic papers, of course, also give like empirical research that you can actually validate. But I do, of course, also use news sources. And the way you try to get over bias, look, most news sources are biased in some way. Uh, the thing is that you just need to look at different news sources in order to sort of determine which bias is, is right and sort of balance the different news sources against each other. Also, sometimes it's good to know it's actually good to look at a new source that's biased as long as you know that it's biased and you know which direction it's biased and then you also have an alternative new source to balance it out. Look, sometimes I know that if you look at, you know, for instance, something like Al Jazeera, you know that for certain topics they will be biased in a certain way, but it's still useful to look at so that you know that people who have that kind of bias, from that you know what kind of perspective that they're likely to have. And so basically it's a mixture of, you know, looking at academic papers, trying to uh, cut through the mess of the mainstream media, as well as providing my own analysis and opinions. And then Wartrix is asking, what is your political ideology? And I would say that I've done an entire video on that. I've done a political compass test. So if you're interested in watching that, the link is in the description. And the next question is from India. Do you think that Narendra Modi is going to go forward with CAA NRC? Now, for those of you who don't know, CAA NRC is a combination of citizenship laws that were very, very controversial because they were seen as discriminatory against Muslims. And there were massive protests at the beginning of this year against these laws. And basically, I've, done, I've already done a video on this, but I think that Modi is likely to try to go forward with them. On top of that, I'm also going to really be releasing a video on India very soon about the 
current protests from farmers against the new farmers laws so make sure you check that out make sure you put on notifications to be notified of that video then belgfries96 is asking what do you think of the political ideology of andrew yang and i would say andrew yang is actually a very interesting figure uh, simply because he has a much more pragmatic approach to politics which you know i personally like and andrew yang has a you know a whole host of uh, policies some of which are, i think are pragmatic and good other ones which i would question as for his main policy which is universal basic income basically uh, my view on it is mixed most of the uh, economic evidence shows that it doesn't actually reduce people's willingness to work so there's no worry that it's going to cause mass unemployment that everyone will just be lazy and rely on you know ubi however the way he's going to finance it i would question he wants to finance it using a vat tax a value-added tax which would simply be a tax on all you know consumer goods and basically that would simply raise the cost of of living and so the question is by implementing ubi doesn't it simply cancel each other out you give people more money but you also raise the cost of living and ultimately you might see that the policy has very little effect obviously in times of this crisis you know with the stimulus checks it is a very good policy but is it something that you can do in normal times i would say it depends on how you finance it and it depends on the impact on general on the general price level however i would say that andrew yang is very good in terms of anticipating you know the effects of automation and new technologies and i think he's one of the first politicians really to uh, to really bring that to the table which unfortunately most of the other politicians are too old and too irrelevant uh, to be talking about these uh, issues that are relevant for the future. All right, guys, thanks for your questions. Don't forget to fill in the My Take channel poll so that you can vote on the future topics that will be covered in this channel. Also, if you want to support uh, the channel, uh, you can sign up on Patreon. You get access to uh, all the scripts. You get your name in the credits. You get to send in fan requests. And also you get uh, interaction with me. And so if you want to support the channel, sign up on Patreon. Thank you to my Patreons for making this video possible. Like, share, and subscribe. Because this was my take.